Here we go with the eruption, read with permission by Scholastic. 4.47 p.m. Tomas pulled the truck over and Cindy got in. She told him about her broken conversation with John Masters. Tomas told her about the conversation he'd had with the broken-legged thief in back while changing the tire and repairing the undercarriage. The man had said that he and his friend were working in Lago when the earthquake hit in the middle of the night. There had been a great deal of damage to the houses and people had been killed, but he didn't know how many or who. Cindy looked at Tomas's children, smiling in the photos taped to the dash. Tomas wasn't showing it, but she was certain he was sick with worry. Tomas explained that the village priest had returned to Lago just after the earthquake with a van full of orphans, three circus clowns, a dozen performing dogs, and two very small women. That would be Mrs. Rossi and Nicole's sister Leah, Cindy said. Tomas nodded. Mrs. Rossi, Leah, and two of the clowns had been badly injured. A few miles from Lago, the road had opened up, swallowing the Rossi's camper and the other vehicle. The priest and the orphans had been right in front of them and had missed falling into the enormous crack by inches. Because the road was the only way in or out, Lago was completely cut off. The two men had decided to head out on foot. They were both from Puebla and wanted to find out how their families were. They were surprised to see Chase drive up on the quad. The man with the broken leg claimed he had no idea that his friend was going to hit Chase in the head and take the quad. Did you believe him? Cindy asked. Tomas shrugged. Neither of the men had ever driven a quad. When they reached the landslide, his friend took the quad off road and it flipped. The man in back crawled up the bank because he didn't know what else to do. He had been expecting to die there. He may yet die, Tomas said in English, if Chase is unwell. Cindy took her phone out, hoping to reach Nicole with the news about her mother and her sister, but the signal was gone again. John drove the truck up the mountainside at an impossible angle. Mark was holding on to his precious camera with white knuckles. You know, he said, these tires don't have suction cups. But we do have a roll bar, John said. If we flip, we should be okay. Comforting, Mark said. Do we have a signal yet, John asked. Nicole tore her eyes away from the tops of the trees and glanced at the satellite phone she was carrying. No. Maybe it will get better when we get to the tree line. If we get to the tree line, Mark said. Where did you learn to drive? In the Navy. Figures. Lago de la Montaña, Chase said. The dog looked up at him. I'm not sure how you say it in Poodle, but in English it means Lake of the Mountain. The last half mile of road had been steep. The small lake was above the tree line and fed by glaciers, which had now turned from white to gray. The village was on the opposite side of the lake. Looming behind it like a petrified tooth was the summit of Popocatepetl. Uh, I can't say that. I need to look it up. A thick plume of gray ash and steam billowed from the peak into the darkening sky as far as Chase could see. Pepe scampered to the edge of the water and started drinking. Chase joined him. The surface was covered with fine ash and what looked like white floating rocks. He picked one up. It was porous and light as a feather. Porous means it kind of has holes in it. Pumice stone, he said. Pepe picked one up in his teeth and tossed it in the air. Knock yourself out. It's not poisonous. Chase kneeled, cleaned an area of ash and pumice and scooped water into his mouth. He wasn't aware of just how thirsty he had been until the icy liquid hit the back of his throat. He put his head under water and came up gasping from the glacial chill. Whoa! Having his face clean made every other part of his body itch. He looked across the lake at the village. It had taken him so long to get this far, five more minutes couldn't hurt. He quickly stripped off his clothes, tossed them in the water to soak, and then dove in. He thought his heart would turn to ice. He lifted his head above the water. His teeth chattered. Pumice stones bobbed around him like an armada of toy ships. The dog ran back and forth along the shore, barking. Come on in, the water's fine, but the dog would have none of it. Chase stayed in as long as he could, which was less than three minutes. He waded back to shore, shivering. <clears throat> Facing the lake, he rinsed and wrung out his clothes as the air dried his skin. The wind had died down to almost nothing, which meant the ash was not blowing around as much, for which he was grateful. It meant he might still be reasonably clean when he got to Lago. As he pulled on his underwear, he heard something behind him. He turned, expecting to see the dog tossing more pumice around. The dog was there, but he wasn't tossing volcanic rock, and he wasn't alone. 
He was sitting next to an old man and five children. Next to the old man was a wheelbarrow filled with sticks. The five children were carrying bundles of sticks in their arms and giggling. He didn't blame them. A second earlier, they had been staring at his shivering hind end. He would have laughed too. He quickly pulled on the rest of his clothes. When he was dressed, the old man said something to him which Chase didn't understand. No hablo espanol. ¿Hablas inglés? The old man shook his head. Chase pointed at the village. Lago de la Montaña? The old man nodded. That was just about the extent of Chase's Spanish. He thought about mentioning Tomas's name, but realized he didn't know Tomas's last name. I've known Tomas my entire life. How could I not know his last name? He looked at the five children. He did know what Tomas's children looked like though, and none of them were here with the old man. Why are the children out gathering wood? He would have to see why when he got to Lago because he didn't know how to ask. Tomas eased around the curve and then stepped on the gas. He didn't see the dog crates until they were bouncing off the windshield. He slammed on the brakes. What was that? Cindy shouted. Tomas shook his head. They got out. The man in the truck bed moaned. Tomas checked on him before coming around to the front of the truck where Cindy was pulling something out from under the bumper. Dog crates, obviously from the circus, but why did they leave them in the middle of the road? And where are the dogs? Tomas squatted down and looked at the ground in front of the truck. What do you see? Footprints. They followed them to the crack. Chase put the crates there to warn us, Cindy said. Tomas got down on his knees and pushed on the trailer to test its stability. It moved. He took the flashlight from his go bag and leaned over the edge with it. Cindy had seen him and John do the same thing on the levee road during the worst of Hurricane Emily. After a couple of minutes, Tomas popped back up and said, I will go first. That implied that Cindy was going to go second. She wasn't sure she wanted to go at all. What about our friend in the truck? He will have to sit here. Maybe I should stay here with him. Tomas shrugged and jogged back to the truck. He drove forward and parked it as far to the right side of the road as he could. He came back with a coil of rope and Chase's go bag slung over his shoulder. He tied one end of the rope to the bumper. What are you doing? Cindy asked. Instead of answering, he handed her a webbed harness with a carabiner attached to it. What am I supposed to do with this? With a moment's, without a moment's hesitation, Tomas danced nimbly across the wreckage to the other side of the crack. The trailer and camper were still wobbling and screeching as he pulled himself up on the road. Are you with the circus? Cindy shouted across the fissure. I can't do that. Tomas wrapped the rope around the tree, took up the slack and tied it off. He motioned for her to put the harness around her waist and clip the carabiner to the rope. You are crazy. Tomas pointed to his watch. I know you're in a hurry, but still, I can't do this. I will stay here and take care of the man in the truck. Tomas gave her another shrug and turned to leave. Wait. Tomas turned back. Cindy snapped the carabiner to the rope. Just go before you regain your sanity, she muttered to herself. She stepped onto the twisted metal and immediately dropped to her hands and knees. There's no way she would be able to cross it as Tomas had. She began to crawl. Three quarters of the way across, she heard a loud rumbling coming up from the fissure. The wreckage started to sway. She looked up. The sides of the fissure were grinding back and forth like jaws. The metal dropped away as if the earth was swallowing it. Cindy screamed. 5.16 p.m. The old man was kneeling with his arms wrapped around three of the children. Chase was crouched down, his arms around the other two and the poodle. The poodle was whimpering. The children were crying. As the ground rumbled and rolled beneath them, Chase looked up at the volcano. The plume had turned darker and thicker, as if someone was stoking the fire beneath. A church bell rang from the village. He wondered if someone was pulling the rope or if the quake was causing it to toll. Chase had glanced at his watch the moment they had dropped to their knees in the middle of the road. When the quake finally stopped, only 13 seconds had passed. The shaking terrified the tiger. He unsheathed his claws and gripped the dirt so the ground would not drop out from beneath him. When it finally stopped, he continued to hold on for several seconds. He had lost track of the deer some time ago. Other scents were now pushing up the mountain. 
He lifted his head and listened. He heard the bang of metal in the trees below. He did not like the sound. It reminded him of the night before when the world came apart and the other cats lay still. He moved away from the noise so it could not catch him. John, Nicole, and Mark were sitting upside down, pushing airbags out of their faces. 13 seconds earlier, they had been heading up the mountain on a steep incline. The trees had begun to thin out, making it easier for John to pick and choose his route. The truck had started to slip sideways and tip to the left. John shouted for them to lean to the right, but their weight wasn't enough to put the truck back on four wheels. The four by four rolled over in slow motion and landed on its roof. Then it started to slide, spinning like a windmill, banging off several trees, before coming to a jarring stop against a boulder. Everyone okay? John asked. I'm fine, Nicole said. It seems to me that we were in this exact same position a couple of days ago, Mark said. Not this exact same position, John said. That time we were on our side. Oh yeah, that's right, on a train trestle. Are you okay? John repeated. Couldn't be better, Mark said. Can we do that again? John unhooked his seatbelt, righted himself, and kicked out the windshield. The three crawled out of the truck and looked it over. The quad had been smashed in several pieces. Guess we won't have to flip a coin to see who rides, Mark said. John didn't hear him. He was already headed up the mountain. Cindy dangled over the steaming chasm, suspended by her waist. Eternal blackness loomed beneath her. There was no sign of the wreckage she had been crawling on moments before. The earth had swallowed it. She reached up and grabbed the rope, not trusting the harness alone to hold her. The rope bowed under her weight. She was 10 feet below the road's jagged edge. Was Tomas okay? Did the, would the rope hold? Did she have the strength to pull herself up if it did? Tomas's respirator-covered face appeared over the edge. He shined his flashlight down on her. Cindy could only see his eyes, but he looked as relieved to see her as she was to see him. Rope fraying, stay still, I pull you up. His face disappeared before she could ask him to explain. Fraying is not a word that you want to hear when you're hanging from a rope. Fraying is when the rope starts to um, come apart. Lots of times it's because one edge got a little cut and then it starts to kind of unravel. She tightened her grip. As a television reporter, she had been in a lot of frightening situations, including Hurricane Emily, but this was by far the most terrified she had ever been. Her heart slammed in her chest. Tears poured from her eyes. She couldn't breathe. She tore the respirator off and dropped it into the void. That was a bad idea to take the respirator off and drop it down into the black nothingness. She took a deep breath and started to choke. Something bad was in the air. Sulfur? What's taking Tomas so long? The end of a rope dropped down. She looked up. Tie to harness, Tomas said through his respirator. Tight. She fumbled with the line. Hurry. Cindy was doing the best she could. The respirator had not worked well against the foul air, but she realized now that it had been better than nothing. What was I thinking? I've got to get out of this hole. With fumbling fingers, she managed to get the line secured through the carabiner and to tie it off. Secured, she shouted. She began to pull herself along the rope, but found that Tomas was pulling her faster than she could move her hands. Within seconds, he had her over the ledge and onto the road. He dragged her away from the crack and gave her a bottle of water. Her mouth and throat were raw from breathing ash and toxic steam, but she washed her face and rinsed her eyes before taking a drink. The village is not too far. Tomas helped her to her feet. He took his respirator off and handed it to her. Cindy shook her head. You keep it. Please, I insist. Reluctantly, she put it on. Tomas took his shirt off, wet it down, and wrapped it around his nose and mouth. They continued up the road toward Lagos. 6.01 p.m. Brittle pumice popped beneath Chase's feet as he walked down the center of the road towards Lago. He had taken the bundles of sticks from the three smallest children. They, in turn, had taken the puppy and were handing him back and forth as they walked. As they drew closer to the village, they passed piles of rubble beside the road. At first, Chase thought the piles were discarded building materials or village garbage, but when the old man and the children stopped at one of the piles, crossed themselves and bowed their heads, he knew he was wrong. The piles had once been houses. People had died beneath that debris. The group stopped three more times before entering the village. 
Lago de la Montaña was much bigger than Chase had expected, and the damage also was much worse. The cobbled streets had buckled, the houses and buildings on both sides had all collapsed. The village was in ruins. The initial earthquake had struck at night while people were sleeping. Chase looked in dismay at the mounds of adobe brick and wood, knowing that some of the people, if not all of them, had died in their sleep. They arrived at the village square. It looked like a refugee camp with dozens of people cooking, cleaning, and hovering outside of crudely constructed shelters. The old man pointed at the church. Padre, he said, inside. One wall of the church had collapsed, but the roof was intact. Popocatapetl's plume rose high above the steeple. The church's front door was open and the people were sitting on the stairs with blank, exhausted expressions. No one seemed even remotely interested in Chase's sudden appearance in the village. Hopelessness, defeat. He had seen the look before in emergency shelters and on the faces of people standing outside of what was once their homes, but this was different. These people have given up. They are waiting for doom. Two men came out of the church, carrying between them a body wrapped in a blanket. Everyone followed their progress across the square to the right of the church with dull eyes. The men laid the body on the ground. The old man said something to the children. The one carrying the puppy handed him to Chase. Then they started distributing the sticks to the shelters for small fires. Chase set the puppy on the ground. They had come to Lago to find Tomas's children, but he didn't know exactly where to start. The poodle decided for him. The little dog ran up the steps through the open doors of the church. Chase ran after him. Dull light filtered through the cut glass windows in the collapsed wall. Candles and oil lamps were scattered along the floor. Dark shadows flickered throughout the nave. It took a few seconds for Chase's eyes to adjust to the dark. The pews had been rearranged and turned into hospital beds, and all of them were full. A murmuring of pain filled the church. Above the pitiful sound, Chase heard the high-pitched barking up near the altar. He wasn't sure why. The poodle wasn't his dog, but he felt responsible. He started to weave his way through the pews towards the front. It was a sad sight. The people lying on the makeshift beds were badly broken. Those who weren't hurt were helping those who were. Chase couldn't say it was exactly cheerful inside the church, but the mood was certainly more hopeful than it had been out on the square. When Chase was halfway across the church, a man stepped out in front of him. He was wearing a black cassock dusted with ash and a white clerical collar. Padre, Chase said, yes, are you with the circus? Chase shook his head, relieved to hear that the father spoke English. My name is Chase Masters. I'm Father Alejandro, but you may call me Father Al, or just Al if you like. I think I'll stick with Father Al, Chase said. Father Al smiled. And you say you are not with the circus? No, I just got here. The road is clear? Father Al asked excitedly. No, sorry. Chase explained how he had gotten to the village and why he had come. I'm sorry about the men who robbed you. I know who they are, but they are not from here. They came from Puebla a few days ago to work in our bottling plant. Bottling plant? Agua, water. The lake is glacial, very pure. Montaña water is sold all over Mexico. Our other industry comes from the volcano itself. Perhaps you saw some of our product as you walked here. Pumice stone? Yes, plentiful. His expression turned serious. Of course, after this, I don't know what we will do. The village is in ruins. Many people have died. Others have left. Where did they go? Chase asked. How did they leave? On foot in the middle of the night after the big earthquake. You climbed across the wreckage? Yes. Is it stable? No. They couldn't have gone that way, and I didn't see anyone on the road coming up here besides those two men. I hope they are safe. You say you are here to check on a family? The family of my father's partner, our friend. He is somewhere behind me. I'm sure he'll be here soon. His name is Tomas. That is a very common name. What is his last name? Chase flushed. <clears throat> I don't know, but he's married to a woman named Guadalupe and they have eight children. Father Al laughed. That would be Tomas Vargas. The eight are not exactly his children and Guadalupe is not exactly his wife. You say he's on his way up here? I expect him any time, Cindy said, hoping that nothing had happened to Tomas and Cindy. 
Father Al gave him a broad smile. That is wonderful news. Tomas has very clever hands. The generator is out. It is our only source of electricity. We have tried to fix it, but failed. Tomas does have clever hands, Chase thought. If anyone can fix the generator, Tomas can. What do you mean the children aren't exactly his children, Chase asked. Yes, Father Al said, I should explain. The eight children are orphans. Tomas pays all of their expenses, including their education, if they decide to go to the university. Guadalupe runs the orphanage for the church. She and Tomas have been friends since they were children. They were both raised in the orphanage. Chase had known none of this, but he wasn't completely surprised by the revelation. Tomas was a man of few words. It was probably just simpler for him to say they were his kids and Guadalupe was his wife. It made no difference. He obviously loved them or he wouldn't be down here. Neither would Chase's father. Are the kids okay? Oh yes, we lost no one in the orphanage. In fact, two of those children were with me at the circus in Puebla. The orphanage is behind the church. It's the only building in Lago with virtually no damage. Then all the houses have been searched? Yes, we started right after the big earthquake. Most of the people here were pulled from the rubble of their homes. Many of the people in the square have been up for two days straight looking for survivors. They are exhausted. I called the search off two hours ago so they can get some rest. We will resume the search tomorrow when it's light. Although I fear we have found all we are going to find. Father Al sighed. Alive anyway. The mother and daughter who run the circus are badly injured, I'm afraid. They are in the orphanage where we set up our first hospital. As you can see, it has overflowed here into the church. The three clowns and the dog trainer who came with them are bruised, but fine. The Rossies are here. So you know them, Leah and her mother? That was their camper, Chase said. Unfortunately, yes. I've, we've been looking for them too. The people I was traveling with before, I mean. I know those vehicles belong to the circus. I just didn't know who was driving them. Nicole was shocked. He wondered if his father had heard about this, or Nicole. The uninjured circus people are outside the orphanage resting. Like the villagers in the square, they have been up for two days searching for survivors. The orphanage, Chase said slowly. I walked into the village with an older man and five children. Were they from the orphanage? Gathering wood? Chase nodded. Father Al smiled. We have been giving the children small jobs like gathering firewood to keep their minds off the tragedy in the volcano. What about the volcano, Chase asked. Father Al shrugged. I have lived in Popocatépetl's shadow for over 30 years. This is the worst of the eruptions and it might be the end of Lago de la Montaña, but there is nothing we can do. The injured are not strong enough to walk off this mountain and they outnumber those who are well, so we cannot carry them. It is up to God. Chase understood Father Al's reasoning but he had been taught his entire life that there's always something you can do. So you're saying it's fate, he said. Father Al shook his head. Not fate, fate. Come with me and I will take you to see the Rossies.